gloves here and this is a video on realistic sound real quick here is a preview of what we're going to be making so you know that this video is worth your time this is the preview so this is the preview uh i'm including it for the people watching this at the end uh, this might be a little strange but this is the preview and it's going to be a longer video because i want to cover the basic principles and ideas i have a little demo here so here's the little here's the preview well here's the preview So that's the preview. Emphasis is given to the trying to make stuff sound real, not to create the most interesting composition in the world. Now it is it is jamming, it is kind of grooving, and I could uh, the flute melody repeats over and over and over. So of course you would change that and make it sound more realistic. But for the most part, this this video is going to focus enormously on the principles of making stuff sound realistic, not on the compositional aspect of writing. Like it will focus on the writing. It's going to, the goal is focused around making you write things that sound real. And that if you, if you follow these principles, it'll work out. So here's the rest of the video. Okay. So now that you've heard that, let's talk about the, uh, the concept of realistic sound. So I was, this was a request. They wanted to know sort of more of the theory behind stuff about writing good melodies, realistic melodies, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. And I have videos 70 through 80 that I recently did that talk about all these melodic tools you have available to yourself. So we're going to, we're going to use some of those, but a lot of this, this question is a question that has been asked in a way that makes me think that you are probably missing some pieces of information you didn't know existed. You're asking questions to try and get an answer, but you're asking the wrong question for the wrong answer. So let me explain what I mean. So like, like this is just stuff you, you just simply probably don't know about quite yet or haven't maybe made conscious realizations. But when you want to get a realistic sound, there are a lot of play people who make these, these videos, reputable companies and producers who give you like, oh, how to make realistic orchestral music, la la la, in like five seconds or less. And it's like, holy crap, dude, like there's, there's more to it. Now there are, and they teach you like what you can do, but there are some more general principles that if you understand these principles, you'll be able to make realistic sounds. So let's talk about this. Now I'm normally, I've, I do stuff like this on my own but i don't publish most of it and what it is is they so we're gonna do drums we're gonna invite some orchestral instruments into the scene we're gonna do uh, a guitar as you heard and a i'm probably gonna do a flute because he, he specifically mentioned a flute now i don't own easy drummer he asked for easy drummer but he did mention contact libraries and i do own complete so i can do that now for guitar so what are, what are the what are the principles of realistic writing? So one is this is the one that almost everyone knows about, and that's the one where you move stuff slightly off the grid. You move things around. You create subtle nuances and volume levels, stuff like that, to make your stuff sound humanistic, like a human is playing it. So that's fine. That's great. That's dandy. Most people know about that though, and so that's pretty easy to do. Now the other thing that makes your stuff sound really amazing is the library you are using. So this is something that people have been told about, but they don't. Not that no one ever really says this. No one says this. At least I haven't seen a tutorial where they're like, you got to buy amazing libraries if you want to sound amazing. But that's pretty much the truth. Like there are libraries. That, I'm going to show you a free one that, sound, that sounds freaking amazing, even though it's free. But for the most part, you're going to want to buy, you know, the best libraries are going to sound the best. It's just the way it is. Um, and they are usually the most expensive libraries out there. So it's just a correlation. And the reason is there are these things. So there are things that you need to take into account when you're recording an instrument. For example, just sampling an instrument is not enough. You need velocity levels because when you hit a key on a piano soft, it's going to sound really different than when you hit that exact same key hard. Then you've got weird stuff that happens that ideally, like one day they'll emulate it somehow perfectly, but I don't even know how right now. 
but they, they've come darn close, which is sympathetic resonance. So when you hit that key in the piano, it's going to make other keys in that same piano, other strings back there resonate. It's called sympathetic resonance. And that's going to sound different. So it's going to sound different every time that you've got your acoustic space. And when you sample it, where are your mics? What kind of mics are you using? Are they far back mics? You know, there's all these things. Are you, are you able to mix mic levels? So that will all contribute to realisticness. Then... Even if you have velocity levels and all this crazy stuff accounted for, if I hit the same note at the same volume level twice, it's not going to sound the same because it's real life. So what you need to do is you get something called round robins, and round robins will make them sound different. Then you have things that you, you also need to think about. Like, for example, the, one of the most realistic vocal libraries out there is called Clara... Clara's solo uh, for her solo voice, but she has another library that's like a full vocal library. And what, what is so cool about this is she does real legato. So there is actual samples of her singing the legato. And then the instrument intuitively knows that when you hold down a note and then you click another note before letting go of that first note, it will trigger that new sample and merge it in there. So it sounds like she actually sang it. Like it's so cool. And uh, so there are all sorts of really advanced things that at the, at the core, uh, when people are giving these general tutorials, they might not know about. And so that is a huge impact, a, a huge impact, a huge impact on how you sound. It's just like a huge one. So don't, I'm just telling you right now, don't fork out for cheap libraries. Just save up and buy the legit one. If you want to sound legit, you're going to buy the legit one. So that's like, that's just right there. That's so much of the battle right there is just buying the libraries. All the most realistic libraries I have seen, all the most realistic like songs, those people have like enormous sound libraries where they have gone. It's in, in many cases, they're part of making those libraries. So... Like Hans Zimmerman, for example, is all over uh, Spitfire Audio and stuff like that. So that's like a whole – for that, it's just in case you didn't know, all this goes into making samples. Now, I'm not going to spend my time in this tutorial making – uh, making explaining how all the what all the different buttons and knobs do because that's just gonna that's like those are individual tutorials on their own. So we're gonna focus on a realistic sound. So so one other thing, this also points out the fact that you're gonna need to learn your library. So writing realistic stuff with your library, what are its strengths? What are what is it good at? And then once you know that, you can write realistic things with that library. That's it's just that simple. So let's move on to uh, the guitar. So I'm going to use something. It's the free guitar I was talking about. It's called Ample Guitar. Maybe one day I'll have a, a separate video uh, in the free VST section. It is a VST. I believe it's also available as an audio unit. Um, there's a Mac version. I know there's a Mac version, which VST runs on Mac. So what is the deal with uh, with this? So this this guitar is freaking amazing. Like it's free. Like there's this is a light version. There's a, a fuller uh, version that's like step up. But it's so like this is just amazing. So you can, like, I've never seen anyone see this guitar and not be blown away by it. Like, especially other guitar players who are, who are like, I'll never see a realistic sounding guitar VST. And then they see this thing and they're like, holy crap. Oh my gosh. That's like, oh, cause it kind of goes against their core. Like it's too intricate. It's too artistic to be captured, but you can capture a piano and drums. Cause you know, you just hit the strings, you, you hit the key and then it does the thing where on guitar, you have all these nuances with your hand. Well, guess what? They're figuring it out guys. So yeah. Anyways, we're going to be using this. So there's this note mode. What's cool is if it, it lands on the same string, it'll slide to that string, so it's kind of a nifty thing. We're not gonna be using this part. We're gonna be using the strummer mode. Again, I'm not gonna explain a whole lot about what's going on here because that's a whole separate thing. But the point I wanna draw out is this sounds super realistic because they've taken into account things that no one else has really, I've ever seen, taken into account this way before. Like this just sounds so real, it's, it's unreal. Like that's like how crazy it is. So, now, they, they do have a whole bunch of different types of um, of guitars, and they have different mic positions, as you can see. So right off the bat, I already know I'm going to want to lower this, and so I'm going to lower the master volume, too. So I'm going to lower this. This is like a stereo image type deal right here. It's like a, a farther back mic. And so we're going to use what's the strummer tab, though, and this is something that, like, you know, guitars can be strummed, and it's a really unique thing. So they've created an entire tool just for this. A lot of other people are starting to do this now, too, but they are the first, and they I think they nailed it, like, hardcore. So uh, for a free thing, this is amazing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to... Now, in case you didn't know, when you're working with libraries, uh, they're going to say, like, oh, like, look at this. If we want to trigger pattern number one, it says note C3, right? 
but there are negative octaves on the keyboard. So there's there's negative there's there's if we go into the mapping editor on contact, it'll show us. So like let's just load up like a clarinet or something and go into the mapping editor. You see we have C negative two, C negative one. Those are negative octaves. So on your piano roll, whenever you're working with a sample library, they're gonna account for this. So whenever they say, oh, this note triggers that, you actually have to go up two octaves for it to officially, to actually trigger the thing you think you're triggering. So that might trip you up at first, uh, just simple work or workflow thing. So I'm gonna turn on the strummer mode. So that turns off the note mode. And there are all these patterns. Now it's gonna trigger actual strumming. So that's really, really cool. Now, uh, Man, I just had a moment right there. <laughs> Uh, what is their name? Native Instruments just came out with their new guitar thing. I'm pretty excited about that. I want to get it. I've never, I haven't looked at it yet, so I'm not sure what kind of tools they use, but it looked like a really cool library. Um, but again, I, these guys, man, I don't know. These guys nailed it. So we have patterns. They have like all these different, ver like they have a whole bunch of guitars too. So I want to buy the bundle though. Like I want to just save up and just buy the whole friggin' bundle. So we have uh, patterns, one, two, three, four, five, six. So you can write in a sequence here and they have all the different stroke patterns you can have here. So you have like, you see strum note, downstroke, treble, mute, treble, treble. Uh, then you have like just basic open strokes. And then you have the individual strings, which is really cool. And that's something that we're not gonna touch, but if you really wanna write realistic guitars, I'm telling you, this is like your VST. This is almost like a tiny DAW for itself. You can write out the entire tablature, all the tab and, and tablature will let you be really specific. And they've combined it with notation. And so it's, it's a, it's a cool way. So they've combined notation or tablature for guitar in a way that allows you to get all the articulations, just write really, 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 really realistic stuff. I'm gonna stick to the basic stuff. So I'm just gonna use a, a default pattern they have here. And we're gonna write out our own sequence simply because that would be cool. There's a way to clear all the notes in the sequence. So, you know what? No, I'm not gonna write my own sequence. It's, it's just gonna be crazy. So I'm just gonna go with pattern two. Pattern two is on note C sharp three. Remember, you have to add two octaves, so that's actually C sharp five in the DAW. So I'm gonna come over here to C five and put down a note. And you can hear it's doing its thing. So we're gonna do a four chord progression. And it is pretty loud, which isn't a bad thing, but we're gonna leave it right about there. And now what's neat about this, the reason I don't want to write it out is because the deep writing realistic stuff takes a lot of time. Like it just does. You're, you're spending so much time because you're going to have to do dynamics galore. So you see here, there are different colored notes. So if we look at here, they have this velocity reading, velocity 40, velocity 40, velocity 90, velocity 60, velocity 90. So you see they change the volume a lot. And that's, that's what, um, sorry, that is what is making it sound so realistic on one level. The other level is that they have amazing recordings. Then when you're writing realistic stuff, you also have to ask yourself, how intuitive is the instrument to work with? Because if you have a really, I've, I've worked with libraries that are sound really realistic, but they are horribly like unintuitive. Um, for example, I thought Shredder, I, I bought Sh Shreddage 2 from Impact Soundworks is phenomenal. I, I don't own it, but uh, a shreddage one I thought would be a lot more intuitive than it was when I got it. It requires uh, quite a bit of knowledge about contact. You can sit down and start playing and throwing amps and stuff, but if you want to get at all the different things it can do, it's not quite as intuitive as say shreddage two, which has its own uh, UI and stuff. So I don't, I haven't worked with that one, but I do like, Shred I'm not saying that I don't like, I don't like it. I'm just saying I was a little, a little uh, taken aback by like different things. I expected it to be slightly different than it was, which is, you know, that's just my, my fault. It's my perceptions. So we have our strumming pattern here. It's playing the thing and it is very intuitive to work with was my point. So when you have something that's intuitive to work with, it's really nice. And so we can select chords to strum on these patterns. There's so much cool stuff here. And they also take into account a lot of humanistic things that I'm not even gonna go in depth right now about. So we're gonna we're just gonna do the chord progression they have written out. So to trigger this chord progression, so we can select our chords. Now they have major, major, minor, minor. Let's do a C major, A minor, D minor, and then F major. So it's a play goal. We'll have we'll end up with a play goal cadence. And what we'll do is MIDI music theory. If you want to know about that stuff. So you see MIDI strum notes C1 and they actually did just go up chromatically. So what we're going to do 
And they have, you can even get it the different positions. Just really cool free uh, library. Like, holy crap. So C1 is actually C3 because you got to add two octaves because of those two negative octaves. So we're going to put a C here. And then we're just going to go up chromatically. And that is triggering our different chord progressions. So here we go. And now we have a pretty realistic sounding guitar chord progression. Now I'm going to bring the tempo down. Now I'm going to go to a different pattern for this last one. Why not? Let's go to a different pattern. Let's go to pattern three, which is D sharp three. You might be thinking, this is chromatic two. It's not. Look at this. D sharp three to F sharp three. There's other stuff in the middle because of the way their library is written. So it's kind of like, what? I know. It's like a little unintuitive there, but that's fine. So we're going to go to F sharp three. And so this last measure will sound like so. Oh, my bad. I moved the wrong thing. Keep that there. I want this to be. I'm like, that sounds different. So you see, it's already a really realistic sounding thing. We didn't have to do very much simply because the library is amazing. So that's like my point there. They take into account a lot of things. You, we could do more stuff and start writing out melodies with just a guitar by itself, but we're gonna sort of leave that alone for right now. So now let's move on to, we could go drums. Let's add in some strings, because strings are something everyone's always like writing string lines and whatever. So again, I'm gonna use a library that has really realistic sounding strings. It's called Session Strings Pro. It comes with complete, if you own that. And they have this cool thing called the animator. Now, I, I'm not gonna talk about the specifics of the library, but just know they take into account all sorts of mumbo jumbo that I mentioned earlier that make it really powerful. So we're gonna we're gonna just stick with the basic phrase that just loads up by default because you got to keep in mind our meters. So we're moving in four four. So we want to keep it in four four. And what we're gonna do is we have what's our chord progression is like C something some 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 C A D F. Okay. So I'm just gonna really quick scratch out scratch out sketch out the bass notes. C A D F. And then these two are minor, minor keys. So I'm gonna bring these up. And oh, you know what, I'll, I'll put them down low too. And so we'll do C, and then we'll do an inversion here. We'll do the, ooh, oh man, do I wanna do that inversion? We'll leave the C going through, because that's really nice. And then we'll go up to a D, which is the tonic. And then we'll go down. Maybe we'll just do two two notes. You know, we'll, we'll keep it a little sparse right here. Give some room for our, our stuff. And so this just sounds realistic because you might be wondering, like, how does this sound realistic? Well, I'm using their amazing animator here. And they have all these different articulations you can use. It's very, very intuitive. Uh, so, yeah. So they, And the recordings, again, are just really amazing. So... Uh, we get this, and then we get to the F. Now, these are minor, so uh, we could try outlining the minor here. And then we could go F, C. Oh, my bad. These are minor. I put a major thing for there. See, that sounds pretty good. Now, if now people will say, oh, that sound that already sounds re realistic. So, but we're, we're gonna go a step farther because we're overachievers. I'm gonna automate the volume. I choose to use this automation thing for reasons I explained in other videos. And so we're just gonna start soft and you know, crescendo up. Strings are dynamic, they're just dynamic by nature. They are they are when you want to write something realistic, normally you're gonna have some very dynamic things, and so you're gonna be writing soft stuff and loud stuff and all, all, all manner of dynamics. So be dynamic if you wanna sound realistic. Like the other thing, okay, so this is one more, I think this is the last sort of major principle I have and then we'll just get to composing more. Uh, that is, you must know about the instrument. There are so many people who are like, oh yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna write realistic music but not learn jack about the instruments. Like that is like the most incorrect way to try and do this you could probably go because 
you don't know stuff. Like on the clarinet, there are certain notes that sound bad. Like the throat tones on clarinets are like not fun to play. They're tough to get good tonal qualities. Like if you want a really solid clarinet, like, and then there's the different models of clarinet. Like what kind of models are you dealing with? You know, guitar, guitar, so many people play it that they, that this is a more well-known thing. Like, you know about all these different things you can do on guitar. And if you do all these things, you're going to sound realistic. That's what these guys did. However, like for clarinet and stuff, if you're writing out melodies or let's say you're a guitar and you write out something that sounds like it should be played on the piano, it's not going to sound like a guitar at all. It's going to sound just straight fake. So you got to be aware of the limitations. Like certain notes are tough to play on flute. Like if you played really low notes on flute, those are hard to play unless you have a bass flute. So why you wouldn't write those and you especially wouldn't write those fast because that's just not realistic expectations there are like if you're like an expert mega level player but you're probably not writing music for expert mega level players so and even if they did play it wouldn't sound like the way your instrument would spit it out because they're trying to do these ridiculous things of course it's going to sound different than way different than what it would typically sound like with your standard articulation so you need to learn about it like you need to know that on a violin a staccato sounds different than a spiccato and you need to know that like on a flute low notes are tough on a clarinet throat tones are annoying and if you were to play notes in the third octave on the clarinet those things get hard uh no fourth octave well, the fourth octave those things are like those things are tough tough things to do they don't always sound the best so when you sample it you're being highly subjective like good luck sampling that well because there are like a bajillion different tones you could get up there it just sounds way different so those are all things that like you need to be aware of. Like you have to know the instrument. If you know the instrument, writing realistic music becomes way easier. So you gotta know the limitations. You gotta know what that instrument would do to sound that way. Because when you're writing out music and MIDI especially, you're gonna be you might have a tendency to write a particular way, and it's not gonna fly if for certain times of, for certain kinds of instruments. So anyways, we have our strings, so we're going to add in some dynamics because strings do not sit still like that. So we're going to go down. We get a little softer over here, you know. I like using this because the line, the editor for the automation is just is just wonderful for this kind of thing. And we'll get louder right here. And then we'll like decay down to our volume because I don't know strings that go whoop, boom, because I'm going to do a loop here. So here we go. So I got way too loud. Let's make this bigger. Easier to do stuff when it's bigger. You're gonna spend forever doing this kind of stuff, just so you know, if you're gonna write realistic stuff. Okay, so I'm just gonna kind of settle with that. Now let's add in some drums. Now drums, you might be wondering about rhythms and all sorts of madness. Uh, most, this is, I like these drum editors for a number of reasons. We're gonna use sort of a cheating method. So I'm just gonna pick some arbitrary quit kit. And so we have all these things. There's all, I could talk forever about all the weird stuff going on here. I'm gonna show you like the super easy way and then show you some things I might do to make things stand out more. Well, I'll explain to you what I'm gonna, what I would do, but I'm not gonna do them right now because they just take all this time. So if you push play, they have all these MIDI grooves pre-written. So MIDI grooves. So if you play it, so, so like for right now, this is and these, this play button is separate. I keep forgetting that. So what you do is you come down here and you have all like again drum kits. They've like this is like a science now. Like all, all this is a science now, pretty much. So you want to be aware of this now. This thing is like. Yeah, so they, they've taken into account all the things. So we're going to get to the composing. I, pu I pointed out m pretty much what you need to know about. Uh, all the, I printed out most of the basics for realistic sounds. After that, it's kind of just owning the libraries, applying the concepts, and learning the craft, the skills, uh, like the theory, what notes do sound good, stuff like that. But you can come in here to the groove section on uh, most of the libraries in here. Some drum libraries don't offer this, so, you know, too bad for you. And they're really thoroughly sampled libraries. Some of the things that are a little less intuitive, though, is always writing the most realistic sounding melodies. So they have these like already kind of filled out for you. But if you must know, like it's just basic rhythm. Like you go down, where is the kick? And then 
you go down, you write out your kick, and then you you would get crazy with the volume automation, and you'd write it out, and you would outline a particular beat, and that beat would be more important than the other beats. And that's just good rhythm writing, though. That's not sounding realistic. That's just good rhythm writing. Sounding realistic, all the velocities and stuff are going to, like... Now that's that's uh, sounding realistic is you got to do a lot of velocity level and that's where deep sampled kits are really really nice. So we're just going to find a nice little like groove. So we're gonna, I'm gonna, let's see here. It's, we'll go with that. So what you can do is you can hit this little button right here and you can drag the MIDI onto your clip. Now I wanna do this on a separate pattern. And what I'm gonna do is drag it on, uh, drag it on. Now some of the things I might do, so they have an internal mixer in here that you can do all this, you can do all your drum editing inside. But I like to bounce stuff out so I can get at my own like effects because you know I paid good money for some of these effects and they do pretty specific things. And what it is is you could see their drums. So just as like a drum 101 lesson, you could see that they take massive advantage of the velocity levels, all these things. They just make it sound so real. And the really short notes, there's not really I did, the short notes don't really matter because the, the samples are one shot anyways. But that's just the way they, their MIDI files roll out. And you can see that they land off the grid like this. If we come in here, you will see that they sort of don't land on the beat. And that adds to a sense of realism. Things are happening a little bit before. It creates a sense of like, it's what makes things like sort of jive. So humans don't land right on the beat. It's like, good luck finding someone that lands on the beat perfectly every single freaking time. So this is what, well, we like this kind of stuff, this sort of, uh, variation. This is something that like everyone talks about is moving the velocity levels and writing stuff barely off the beat. It will make it sound much more real. And we could talk about that. There are specific reasons why you'd want to do certain kinds of things for certain kinds of feels. We're going to sort of leave it for now because that's like, I'll do it one day when I start talking about writing realistic stuff with like, like this library or whatever. So what it is, is you, you play, you play in your notes and we have a, a thing. <laughs> And what I will do is, this is my kick, right? So I'll take my kick and maybe I'll grab my snare, which is this guy. There's actually a MIDI standard for the way drums line out. And I will put them on separate channels so I could process them separately. So I'll do that. That's a very common thing I'll do. But anyways, we'll layer this in here and you'll get something like this. And they have these nice fills too. So really, really cool, just a cool options we have here. Let's go back to our grooves. Uh, grooves, 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 grooves. We have some fills here. Okay. That's pretty cool, so we'll take that. So just well sampled libraries, so well recorded, well sampled, sounds, sounds real, go figure. So now that we have this, we're gonna, I moved it. I didn't want to move it. I wanted to chop it. There we go. So now we have this. And now let's add in a flute. And then maybe even like we'll write we'll write a part B to it too. But we'll have all our instruments down so it won't be too tough. Now this thing is like how are you gonna write out your melody? So one of the ways to get a really nice sounding melody and when forego the theory is just to play a melody out. But he was interested, the requester of this thing was interested in writing one out. So let's talk about writing a melody. Uh, okay, so first I'm gonna just settle with, on my. And I just selected a flute. You gotta just know where your stuff is, like what kind of flutes sound the best. Maybe you have a orchestral library. I'm just using the basic contact, contact standard flute. It sounds like this. So right now I'm just going to settle with that articulation and run with it and I'm going to write stuff in. So I'm just sort of going to listen for a little bit of inspiration. So I'm thinking like up here. Now flute players again, this note down here, that's a tough note. Like even the sample itself sort of runs up into it because it's, those are just hard notes to play. So. 
me down. Da 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 da. Something. Like Do I go to G here? No, I go to A minor. Well, G sounds fine right there, so it's, that's like just whatever. So what this is, oh, you know what? I'm. This is what I'm hearing. The, the name for this sort of a tool is a... I forgot if it's an anticipation or a... It's not a suspension because a suspension... Well, I mean, it resolves up. It wouldn't be a retardation because we have a note and then the same note would have to hit again. This is... And it wouldn't be an appoggiatura. I guess this is just a passing tone. It's just whatever, I guess. I don't know. You guys you guys tell me what you think this is if you have like a fancy name for it. But for me, it just, just sounds nice. There's a... Yeah, so this re resolution. An appoggiatura has the same idea, though, where you land on a tone that's not in the chord, and then you resolve stepwise to whatever it is you're doing, but we're just stepping. So it's just a neighboring tone. I guess neighboring tone would be, like, what this is. <laughs> do, do, do. Now, you can focus on the theory behind it all day, but, of course, having some sort of, like, a little bit of inspiration you're never going to get anywhere if you don't have some sort of an idea to run off of. And then I'm going to steal this rhythm over here because it is correct. And so, yo. Do a little run up, this little scalier run. That, that sounds nice, lots of little tones. Now, something else that's important when writing, see, like, I, I'm doing this intuitively, but flutes, they have to breathe. So if you if you already hand this to a flute player, they can totally play this. Be well within easily range. If you're writing out music, because a lot of people do this when they're starting out, I did it a ton. Uh, you write out music that's, like, really, really hard or practically impossible, or you never breathe. Though All those things are going to make your music sound less real. They're just, they're just gonna, because if they're harder to play then they're going to sound really different. And so if they sound really different and, and you need really advanced level players to play them, most people are just not going to associate. It's going to sound fake. And so you want to write out stuff that's going to be, you know, realistically within the capabilities of a player. Usually, you of course, you're going to have like maybe a moment or two where you might get a little crazy, but you want to, you know, exercise your judgment. <laughs> So we got we got a kind of a nice thing. So this uh, now we might be saying that sounds pretty real. And flutes flutes aren't as dynamic. Flutes are pretty much they do have dynamics. Like they do exist. If you've ever played in a band, you might be saying, "Nah, they don't. They don't. They don't have dynamics." But they do. The good ones do. And I'm gonna add a little bit of reverb. Reverb is a way to add big time realism. Post post processing is like a whole other topic entirely. But what we're gonna do is instead of Instead of uh, doing, I'm going to change the, uh, man, oh my gosh. I'm going to change the articulations, and that will make it sound more realistic. This one doesn't necessarily call for huge velocity level changes where it's sitting at right now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come through here. Remember, you got to add two octaves because of those negative octaves. So it's actually C2, not C0. And so we're going to come in, and we're going to go... We're going to change the sustains around just to get different sustains. So that'll add some, some subtle realism to it. I could move my melodies around. Like I can move them, do stuff like that. Come over here. They have options though, where it'll automatically do this, do that for you, but you could do that. It does add, it is more realistic. And then you could very slightly change like 
velocity levels, you could be like, oh yeah, we're getting touchy. But you want to be careful because if it triggers an entirely separate sample, then you might be in for it because then it'll sound really different. So you'll you'll discover that kind of stuff as you're going. But people do stuff like that. That that does add it. It is a big difference maker. That kind of stuff. But all the stuff I explained to you before is the stuff that most people are missing. So we have this. So we're gonna come in here and it's on C. We can close this. I'm not using that. We have C0. So I'm gonna put C0 first and then E and F are the other articulations I wanna look at for now. So I'm gonna put C0 here to set my articulation. So it starts on that one. And then I have this doo -doo -doo -doo. and I kinda like the way that sounds, but we could try a D sharp zero and see how that works out. So we could try a D sharp zero right here. And then on the E, which lines up right here, we'll go with a different and then another short. Oh, and I'm writing my notes way down here. After I just said they have to be two octaves up to work. So C2. Let's go back to C0 on this one. See how that's that's pretty nice. And so I choose to put this here because there's no notes happening in between. And sometimes I'm not sure if it's triggering. Sometimes it doesn't trigger if they're at the exact same time. Sometimes you can't avoid it. There's a cool plugin um, someone made to avoid this kind of a problem, but I don't remember. I, have, I haven't used it yet, so maybe I'll get into it a little bit more. Anyways, we have this cool thing. And then we'll go to the E zero. Why not? That's a different sustain. They're just different sustains. And we'll, we'll change the sustain again. So what the heck? We even, we're even we just getting crazy. Because this one doesn't have round robins. As far as I know, maybe it does. But we could go check real quick. Group editor. Nope, doesn't look like it. So, yeah. Now these these ones sound really soft though. Those are not those those sustains. Like, let me show you. It's just knowing your instruments. Um, these sustains. See how much softer those are. So I'm just gonna go with, I'm just gonna run with that. I don't wanna get like too crazy. If you do too much, it can begin to sound not realistic anymore. Right there, that could use the same sort of treatment. That's pretty cool. And then we'll change back to C at that one. And so we're gonna, I'm gonna loop this just twice. Um, and I'm just gonna go ahead and clone this part. I'm just going to clone it and what I'm going to do is I'm going to add in a, a bass because the bass would sound pretty cool. So on contact, they have this, the Rickenbacker bass, which is a really nice bass. I'm going to go with that. I'm feeling the Rickenbacker bass right now. We're going to do just the regular one. So again, all the reasons I said before, like, honestly, you have the principles, you can apply them. So I'm just, I can just start working. So I like using the pattern editor like this because then I can just hit make unique and bang. This is now a completely unique clip. So if I wanted to change and vary things in here, I can do that and it won't change previous clips. Other, other DAWs have different ways of doing it. It's just different ways of looking at it. Some might find them a little more convenient. So I'm just gonna outline the chord progression. Do, do. And we go to do 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 A minor. Mm -hmm. We could even match this thing right here. So we go do. Now this does have a, I believe it can slide too. 
but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna get super fancy with this. Now, what I am gonna do is I'm gonna move these things slightly off because it sounds a little, it being perfectly on the grid is a little weird. Um, so. And then this can be, it, it needs to have a space. down to a G. Little run, add a little space. It's just, if it, the samples will like bleed over each other. So you need to do that. Sometimes people will write out things, samples that are, I'll talk about pianos here in a sec too, because I guess pianos are important too. Oh, it's an F. I'm like, well, that sounded kind of unusual. This is fine because it serves as a leading tone in the next part. So it's like acceptable, even though it's not in the chord. Um, it'd be called an anticipation. So I'm going to take this G and move it simply to an F. There you go. There you go. That sounds quite nice. So uh, pianos. Let's talk about those real quick. That's another one that has sort of a special deal. So pianos have these pedals. I'm a piano player. It's one of my instruments. I really like the giant, so we're just going to use the giant. And one of the things about uh, this is you can assign a MIDI CC controller to control the pedal, and that's the way I prefer to work. I, uh, preferably, I would just sequence my own stuff in but uh, by playing it. But what you can do here is we can, like, we can outline our chords, so we'll do, like... And instead of using the pedal, we'll do what a lot of, because some libraries aren't so fancy and don't have like fancy smashy pedals lying around. So what we'll do is we will go, uh, we'll take our C and we'll go up and down and just create this arpeggio motion. And we'll keep our notes long. So they'll ring out all the way. This is similar, if you were to hold down the piano pedal, it's pretty much what it's going to do for you. So it's called, uh, you'll see functions on a lot of VSTs called sustain, hold or whatever, referencing the pedal. So... I'm just going to run up the chords. Now, notes won't re-trigger if I have them out all the way on this, so it's like... Oh, I just realized I'm doing weird crap, so my rhythm is not consistent. piano is just too soft. Let's turn it up so we can hear it. So now I'm just going to clone this. And now I could get crazy with velocity levels and stuff too, but I'll deal with that later. Because I told you, realistic music can just, it's fun to write. It just takes a while to do. So we're going to do, uh, what is this, A? It's A minor. I'm not going to even do inversions or anything. These notes are fine. Okay. And then we go to D. Yes, we go to D which is also minor, I believe. So we'll go to D. We'll just change this to a minor deal. I'm not going to let the ring out there. So piano players will lift their foot to avoid sustains that happen where they might clash like that. So something else you want to be aware of is they might lift their foot when they do so. All the notes at that particular spot will get shortened. So I'll, I'll just say piano player lifts his foot there, whatever. And... Uh, D, 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 F, F, just regular F. And then we have G, which is an interesting deal inversion-wise. I'm going to do the full inversion. Make it major. 
Now, this is something tough in FL that you just have to figure out what you want to do with later. But here we have our piano. I'm not going to do a velocity stuff on it, really. Or maybe I'll do some general, general velocity sculpting. It's just like this one gets the emphasis. And then we have something like this. It's triggering the notes that happen right there. Okay, so let's uh, let's write it out. Let's just create a little bit of a form. Let's do. Oh my gosh, it's gonna save it in a weird location, freaking again. I'm gonna go to users. I'm just gonna type realistic demo. unique i'm gonna let these ring out this is gonna be our end i'm gonna create i'm creating the little demo for the beginning right now so i need some sort of a small intro too drum fill <laughs> you're supposed to yeah if you don't name your stuff you end up doing this so be aware that you may live that life that's perfect you know perfect perfect schmurfic man the fact that you can do the midi thing with that is so insane like this is so beautiful thing thing that I noticed about this flute uh, and that's something else that is from a mixing perspective will make it sound more real too is in, when you sit in an orchestra watching an orchestra you know the flutes are going to sound like they're over there the clarinets are going to sound like they're over there the basses are going to sound like they're over there uh, well for me for me that's how it's going to be for you I think it's all backwards because the screen flips it but you know there's going to be a space now this flute though it sounds like it's way over there and that's fine it's kind of cool uh, but it's a little far over there for my setting, if you follow what I'm saying. So this is like concert hall, whatever. This is just reverb. I don't even know why I related it to that. But, you know, I'm. this is like a small band sort of feel right now. So I'm going to change it so that it is not so far over there simply by just panning it. So pan it. I'm going to pan it right. Because it's got that feel. So that's just something that's subtle. It's a lot more obvious on headphones. Um, it's just easier to detect. So let me, make sure. I wanna make sure this last part ends out nice. Okay, I'm gonna do a volume fade right there of the piano. I was going to do a master fade, but that's not the best idea. Okay. And then on the piano, I like to automate this knob. 
have it fade out right there. So yeah, another thing is those resonances will ring out in real space. So you want to have that. Maybe make it a bit longer. Yeah, that's really nice. That sounds really good. So, okay. Um, so, this is the preview. So this is the preview. Uh, I'm including it for the people watching this at the end. Uh, this might be a little strange, but this is the preview. And it's going to be a longer video because I want to cover the basic principles and ideas. I have a little demo here. So here's the little, here's the preview. Well, here's the preview. So that's the preview. Emphasis is given to the trying to make stuff sound real, not to create the most interesting composition in the world. Now it is it is jam and it is kind of grooving, and I could uh, the flute melody repeats over and over and over. So of course you would change that and make it sound more realistic. But for the most part, this this video is going to focus enormously on the principles of making stuff sound realistic, not on the compositional aspect of writing. Like it will focus on the writing. It's going to, the goal is focused around making you write things that sound real. And that if you, if you follow these principles, it'll work out. So here's the rest of the video. And for you people watching this at the end, thanks for watching. This is a much longer video than I had anticipated it being. Uh, for your, I'm going to do one more thing for the guy that uh, wanted to know more about melody writing. So I have this melody right here. I'm going to write out a small counter melody uh, super quick. So flute comes in over there, right? So what I'm gonna do, and I'm not gonna include this in the preview because I already did this weird preview thing. So uh, the flute is right here. Flute. And what we're gonna do, whoops, is we're simply just gonna change the notes around. And so you just, you simply develop it. So you change a couple of things, you make certain notes long, and I'm keeping this rhythm here because it's a motif, it's, a, it's an idea, melodically. playing why is it playing where's that high note i don't see a high note do i have a high note in here shouldn't I? there's no doo doo though let me solo this flute Sounds like there's a higher version of it. I don't even know. So keeping keeping it the same for the most part. 
Um, I might, I, if I could, if I added in a second flute and added harmonies, it'd be really cool too. And then I'd have to keep a, a you know, some sort of a arrangement between these two players because if I want to keep it realistic, I want them to sound like they're playing together, that kind of a thing. So I'd, I'd write them on separate lines and then I'd be specific. Like I took out that one overlapping note because flute players can't do that and the samples were cutting off fine. So it wasn't a sample issue. So now if I play it, it'll flow melodically much nicer than it was before. Up. Now, I would not settle. There's a number of things that I heard uh, that creatively I'm like, ooh, I'd change that, I'd change that, change that. But they're, they're, they're just decisions I would make. They're just opinions, really, about, like, oh, I'd come to this part of my melody and start fixing it up. And that's really good when you start having creative pull like that. So, yeah, if you have any questions, let me know. Subscribe and have a blessed day. I'm going to explain exactly what you should expect. We'll talk about that. And we'll talk about what music theory is and why it matters to you so you have reasons to continue on. And I'm going to be teaching it from two perspectives. So the first one, I guess I'll start with the one that's not very common, is the MIDI. I'm going to be teaching it inside a DAW. And it's you're going to be expected to know different things and learn them differently, or at least I'm going to teach them within a...